Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is Andrew, and I'm so excited whenever I have a Broadview Press book to represent and to bring to you all because I get all of the advanced titles of what's coming out and what has been newly published in this case. And as you all know, Broadview Press graciously sponsors the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And today I actually get to talk about Sound writing, a guide to making audio projects. So I was joking with my two guests. This is literally a break the fourth wall behind the scenes of what it means to even be a podcaster. So can't wait for this conversation. And I know a lot of you out there are podcasters who listen or you have come to me asking to start your own podcast. So you don't want to miss this conversation, right? Get your cup of coffee, get your tea. Go for your run, go for your walk, and we're going to dig right into it. So let me introduce my two guests here who I'm so excited to actually meet for the first time outside of emails, uh, which I don't count as meeting. Uh, so I am joined here with both doctors Tanya K. Rodrigue, who is an associate professor of English at Salem State University. Oh, in Salem. I miss Salem. Okay, we'll have to talk about that later, Tanya. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Kyle D. Stedman, who is an associate professor of English at Rockford University, which I think is in a state I've never been to, Illinois. Is never that right? been to Illinois. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I somehow always top. bypass the Midwest. It's um, not because I don't want to go. I just am <laughs> such a Northeastern and West Coaster. I've been on the coast a lot. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Chicago might be calling me up one day. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, welcome you two um, to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, so I think right away, what I was just so interested in is you bring out this book, Sound Writing, in 2022 with Broadview Press. And I think everyone is going to want to know when they've read this podcast title, because sound writing is in the podcast title. It has to be. It's so intriguing. When did you both come across the term sound writing? You want to take this, Kyle? Yeah. Well, I I don't know if I should give the long answer or the short answer. Um, I personally, <laughs> personally, I've I came across it uh, with my friend and co-writer Courtney Danforth. She's a professor in Las Vegas, and. Um, she and I have co-edited with Michael Ferris three edited collections that all have the word sound writing in the title. And actually that came from, from Courtney. She was teaching classes um, in the early, I want to say maybe 2008 or so. I'm going to probably get that word wrong. Uh, and and she, uh, be, because of, of an injury, because of an attack, she was having trouble um, actually reading her students' written words on the page. And she was a writing teacher. And she, she's written about this elsewhere. Um, and it was like, what am I supposed to do? But she found that she could process, uh, after the accident, she could, she could process auditory stuff really well. So she started having her students make audio essays, read them. And the more she started doing that, she said, this is really exciting, good stuff. And from there, started doing it purposely, and really started being a, a leader in the field of of how to do this. So, so in some ways, I'm kind of um, got into this a little bit from from Courtney. Well, and that's so fascinating, Kyle. Actually, because my podcast it all started during the pandemic, mm -hmm. a few months in into that summer of 2020, because. I was experiencing how isolating it felt to read um, without any sound on. And before I look back before the pandemic and I was reading academic articles, like my PhD seminars, I don't remember ever needing to have music on. And I'm thinking it was such a different time in terms of that experience of senses. And I'm thinking it has to have really changed the landscape when we weren't in conversations with people, we weren't socializing. And then I discovered Spotify and realized there were all these genre topics that I was invested in. And then now I easily have an audio book on as I'm reading or the brain has been retrained in a way. And we can get into uh, definitely some have retrained their brain to think auditor in an auditory way. Others still have a hard time. Um, they need to have one 
um, sense invoked at one specific time, if that makes sense. Like they can only listen to audio or they can only write in silence. They can't mix these, um, the media together. But, well, okay, Kyle. So you definitely got us thinking here. Um, it's helping me reframe how we're even sitting down right now talking. Uh, but Tanya, how did sound writing come into your life? Kyle. <laughs> ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's so, not true. <laughs> well, I mean, the word, the term yeah. itself. And so, I mean, I engaged with all of the scholarship that um, Kyle just mentioned, and I was part of uh, one of the collections. And so I was, re I mean, you really did. You're, you and Courtney and Michael really introduced me to the, to the word, which yeah, I use and teach other people to use. And it makes a whole lot of sense. And in terms of it, you know, paralleling to the writing and the writing process itself, right? Mm -hmm. And you you were teaching people how to do the stuff that we we started calling sound writing before before you were using the word, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. I wasn't. I think that um, I think I called it composing with sound for a long time. Like I taught a grad class, I think in two thousand and I don't know sixteen, composing with sound. Um, yeah. I, well, it was. It's been a while, but I a while back I remember trying to to find all of the titles that people in our field, you know, in this kind of rhetoric writing world, who were doing sound classes, and I think composing with sound was the most common. I remember finding like eight or nine. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. or writing with sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and it is almost a metaphorical onomatopoeia word that, right? I mean, an onomatopoeia lesson, an SAT lesson, everyone, is a word that when you say it, it actually is that sound, like woof or roar. But in this metaphorical way, sound writing does make a lot of intuitive sense mm -hmm. that I'm literally conveying the written word through an audit audio process that mm -hmm. I'm delivering this narrative through audio, but it still is a narrative. And you do have this really interesting moment, both of you in your preface, which just is so intriguing to me, where you even bring up the ancient Gr Greek uh, concept of sound, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you like go to our origin. Do you want to get into maybe a little of that? Because I don't think people, I mean, you don't have to give an ancient Greek lesson. Oh, but do I, to, do I have to go back to the book and read what we wrote? <laughs> no, but like how I'm pretty sure the root is um phono, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you yeah. see you see words like you see words like phonograph and people have, mm -hmm. have been finding again, this is something I, I worked on with with Courtney in another project. I feel like I'm just gonna keep referring to other things. Uh, where where she really did a, a deep dive into all the people throughout history that she could find who have put the word sound and the word writing together and phonograph is the easiest one like phono and you know graph for some some kind of writing mm -hmm. um and it, well, it's we fascinating have... we have we have all these ways when we, especially when we start thinking about recording we're like oh isn't isn't recording we're inscribing something we're, we're letting people get to it later the sound isn't just drifting away it's it's been written in some way yeah and when i grew up as a child in the 90s we had the hooked on phonics yeah so that which i'm not sure where phonics went but that's a whole other conversation i really got into that podcast i don't know if both of you have listened to it something about oh i'm not going to remember the correct title but it's this news podcast about um how curriculum is taught now to grade school children with English and literature specifically. I'll find it as we're talking, but it was very interesting because they said that phonics, there's been a shift away from phonics and more towards how um, younger students are being trained to not necessarily sound out words, which is I'm sure how the three of us were really trained. Instead, they'll just show an image of a picture and say, well, what word is that? And they're almost doing this associative um, process. And yeah, but I'll find that podcast because it's fascinating since, again, I think even in our conversation, you've referenced projects, Kyle, Tanya, you've talked about how this whole book has been so collaborative. I'm talking about podcast references. Mm -hmm. I think it really shows that we're in a new moment of learning, of 
bringing to bear all of our almost bibliography process. Like our bibliography is so collaborative now. It isn't static. It isn't just in the library stacks or siloed in a way. Mm -hmm. um, like, how do you both reflect on that, especially with what you were doing in your book that is such a collaborative process? Why is that so important to work together as a team? You're passing it to me. Uh, yeah, have Tanya. So, Tanya, you go. Yeah, so the question about like why we chose to write it collaboratively or like the collaborative nature mm -hmm. of of sound writing in general or or where where do you want me to start? Yeah, no, any of that is any of up that? for grabs. Um let's maybe I'll start with a book, Kyle. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. So um I got this idea for the book because I was teaching audio storytelling and I was, you know, uh, assigning audio projects and classes and different kinds of writing classes. And I was really struggling to find one kind of place where my students could engage and learn about all the things that I wanted them to learn. There was nothing that existed that framed sound writing or audio projects from a rhetorical perspective, had a rhetorical framework. There are other kind of great books that I pulled from, like Jessica Abel's, um, what's the title of that book? Out on the Wire, yeah. Out on the, Out on the Wire. Um, I pulled from, you know, some stuff in, in Comparet, some stuff in um, linguistics even. But I thought I need something that my students can easily digest um, and something where it can be kind of like a one-stop shop for, you know, teaching them about sound writing from a rhetorical perspective. And so I had this idea and I was like, okay, this is like a big endeavor. I don't think I can do this by myself. <laughs> um, and I know that Kyle had a lot of experience um, with with sound writing, with sonic rhetoric as a scholarly area. And I had been working with him on one of his collections, Amplifying Sound Writing. Mm. And um, I, I liked, you know, from reading his work, I enjoyed reading his work. I always thought he was a great writer. Um, and I also liked the way that he interacted with all of the people that we were working on this collection with. He was very easygoing and conversational. And um, I like that, like no detection of academic ego whatsoever, Kyle, right? And so I was like, yeah, were you, did you want to- Well, that, that tone I think was really important to both of us as we yeah. went on throughout, because I, I don't remember if it was from the beginning or as it developed, but like, like Andrew was saying, this is the kind of thing that so many people want to do and want to get better at and want to kind of understand. So kind of saying, well, we we know a lot about rhetoric and we know a lot about writing. And that actually has a lot to say about how you produce audio and how you how you sound right. Yeah. So we started saying like our by by making this an ex using our accessible style, I, I think that we're both good at already, makes the book something that isn't just has to stay in a classroom all the time. Like I, I have a friend in town who who's um, going to start reading audiobooks, and I saw her at, at a museum thing, and she said, hey, did you know, um, I just got a copy of your book, and she's not a scholar, she's not an academic, and I was like, what are you talking about? You've got a copy of my book, and she's like, no, because I want to get better at this, and it's exactly what I needed, so I, I hope we're kind of fitting into little gaps, just like Andrew was saying, kind of in a, in a bigger picture. Yeah. yeah, and you talk about your audience right away of breaking this notion, which is so um speaks so much to the work as a public scholar that i'm committed to as an lgbtq plus public scholar with my work and the podcast here which is yes this speaks to your students i know you both are in rhetoric and writing uh trained in that field i mean i'm from literature which intersects but it's not just for the university community. It speaks to anyone who wants to, like your friend, learn about the process and tips of how to actually incorporate audio projects into your life um, or even analyze audio work that 
to analyze an audiobook, to analyze a podcast or a YouTube channel, whatever you're consuming. Yeah. And that, yeah. that word public is so, so all over your podcast site, right? Like you really do want this to be public humanities. And it, so there, there's something cool that I think we're all interested in and in, in going beyond just the academy all the time. Yeah. Well, and what do you think? There's this term that, I mean, Tanya already wrote, brought up composer which i think is such it, it has that musical categorization you think of it and you, audio and video engineering does really have that musical journalistic in a way field specific language but when you use the term composers of sound like you're saying anyone really can start to become a composer of sound if they learn the process like, what is a composer of sound, Tanya? Especially because you brought up the word composer. That's so funny because that's just what I, I use composer for writer in every instance. Um, largely because I, like, for example, I'm teaching a multimodal writing course right now. And, you know, I do, I do a lot of stuff with sound. And writing, the term, is so closely associated with alphabetic writing, right, with with words on the page, that I've kind of adopted this term composer as just a, a replacement um, as, as writer. So uh, a composer of sound, a composer of visuals, a co <laughs> composer of, you know, multimodal texts. Um, yeah, I just use it as a, I just use it. And it's funny that you say that because my colleague the other day, she was like, do you ever say writer anymore? I'm like, <laughs> Wow. Like I, it's composing and it's composers. It's just like I've adopted that terminology because I think it's, you know, it encompasses other kinds of communication that students are producing in my class and that people are producing. I've, wait, Andrew, you kind of are hinting at like the, the, when you hear composer these days, the first thing I think, if I'm not in an academic mindset is like, you know, a, a classical composer, like a, the composer of a piece of music, a composer of this film score. Uh, and I've heard once, I don't know, I don't have the citation to back it up, but I've heard that music got the term from rhetoric people. You know, I mean, like back in the day, you know, like 16th century or something, the people, rhetoricians were, were talking about, okay, how, how can we compose a text for our audience to be effective for the people in the way we want it to? And um, you know, there, there were people who were writing Bach, Bach had on his bookshelf a um, like a book about musical rhetoric, about how to apply ancient Greek and Roman rhetoric principles to the composing of music. And it's like, and around then, you know, 17th, 18th century, people started saying, well, we should call music that. And then it's, it's changed. Yeah, the origins etymology always fascinates me because it, it tells the story. Oh, and that podcast is called Soda Story, just in case okay. anyone, <laughs> you know, it's a good uh, sold a story okay but actually you know what you're saying kyle like how we think and tanya too how a word gets associated with a certain field of study or a genre um yes broadway composers i mean i've had broadway artists on this podcast and i always think broadway composer and we we tend to start to box things into categories, but I love how freeing it is, Tanya, that you're using composer as because it makes sense. You are. I just was saying to my dissertation advisor, and as this comes out, I'm about to defend my dissertation on July 7th. So hey. <laughs> it's probably like a month away when this comes out. So yeah, nice. almost there. And I started to use this metaphor of I'm suturing my writing. Like that's literally how I feel when I'm transitioning my paragraphs, because, you know, as my process, I tend to write very, um, I write out my analysis in one specific, say, poetic moment with Whitman. That's what I'm working on. But I like have the homoerotic ideas, but then I really need to figure out the bridge. And like, oh. to me, I'm thinking, okay, how am I stitching this body of writing together, right? And we use the term body of writing. So it does have a suture feel, but metaphors are powerful. And especially for our creative process, which is why, do you think with your students, like I see this with my students, 
they really have taught me so much about what they're consuming. And even though they might not be reading 800 page novels, because I'll hear that criticism from faculty, mm. they are reading, they're reading in different ways. Like they're absorbing information in such interesting ways, especially through audio and film. Like how have your students informed both of your processes about your work, especially on sound writing? Yeah. You want to start? Well, it's, it's complicated. I, <laughs> you know, there, there are the students who, who, like you said, who, who love it, who are like, this is the kind of thing I've always wanted to do. I've seen people make stuff and I want to know how to, how to make it sound good. Um, I had a student once say, uh, she had been trying to to make videos. I forget for what context, um, and she was always annoyed at how bad her sound went. You know, she could do the video editing, um, and I think that is a sign sometimes of you know if it's if it's really bad, it's like oh this person didn't think about it at at all. Not not that we have to be perfect all the time. Uh, but I I I think I get more of the. I I guess what I want to say is that I I get more students who say, I've never listened to any podcast ever. I've never listened to any audiobook. I have, I have no idea what you're talking about. And maybe that's true. Maybe not. You know, maybe we, I can start saying, no, there are places you've seen designed, um, structured, rhetorically created, composed audio, and we can, we can analyze that. But a lot of times it is true that they haven't heard very much or thought much about it. So, so I think I have to do a lot of listening first. Like, let's listen to a lot of podcasts. Let's listen to, um, maybe to, to some interesting audio books, especially ones that are using music and sound effects and things like that. Let's more and more and more of that because it's, it's hard for them sometimes to say, how am I going to make this if they have no idea of what it is they're even doing first? I mean, that applies to any genre. I feel like that when I teach memoir, creative nonfiction too, I'm like, you know, it's like in a, it's like in a personal essay, like in a, in a personal what it's, a, it's you have to treat, teach the context and the genre before you start making in the genre. Mm -hmm. But I do yeah. think that a lot of students have some pretty savvy technology technology skills. Um, totally. That's really helpful. Like one of my, I'm, I am advising an honors thesis right now, and the thesis project is a podcast, mm -hmm. um, and it's so really interesting because I've been helping him and guiding him, and he took my audio storytelling class. But he's also been doing a lot of learning on his own. And he's been teaching me right alongside, like, Tanya, I found this really cool program. You know, he showed me Band Lab. He's like, I'm creating and I'm writing my own music. And I've taught myself some musical theory to just, you know, to do kind of this stuff. I'm like, oh, show me, you know, um, mm -hmm. just been kind of cool and exciting. Yeah, well, and I've been joke. I mean, it's I was joking with my dissertation advisor, but it is true. My podcast is an annotated bibliography in a way. Like all the guests I've had on, I've had the pleasure to use their work and their queer theory or their um, angles and analyses to queer poetry and cite them. And it, there's something so beautiful, whether it's when I interviewed Gregory Maguire about Wicked and how it got onto the Broadway stage. And there's been so many, I mean, I just had Marianne Williamson on to talk about running for president. And, you know, it's been a trajectory of the certain guests, but you do get into, podcast is such a general term. Like there are so many genres. There's podcasts that feed a news network, like CNN's podcast. There's, um, right, that's like more of a corporate model. There's the podcasts that are actually representing a publisher or represents an author's work or is just a hobby. I mean, I don't want to throw out a hobby like as putting it down. It's not, but it, it doesn't reflect the uh, career of the host, like where there's all different ways of why you might want to put out that platform and to think thoroughly and analyze is important, like, who do I want to reach? And you talk about that, about the audience, like, and why is audience, do you, it's so important, especially with your students, I'm sure, of, well, who are they trying to have listen to their words and their work? Yeah, that's where we're, we're, we're teaching them rhetoric all the time through every kind of genre and different kinds of modes and combinations of modes, but we're always 
helping them think like, who's your audience, right? What's your purpose? What kind of strategies and tools are you going to use to effectively communicate to your audience and kind of make an impact? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of what what we're trying to do with this book is to help people think carefully about how to make strategic decisions and employ particular rhetorical strategies that have that impact that make your listener kind of like, you know, perk up, be engaged, interested, right. But also help you achieve your particular purposes with your piece. And and if a student, students are actually, I I always ask them, you know, like if for your, for the final, final podcast project you're doing here at kind of the end of this class, um, do you want it to be public or not? Um, Mm -hmm. And usually they say yes. And when, when they do, then that, that gives you some really cool um, opportunities to say when you're listening to drafts and things like, People don't know what you mean there. I mean, it depends who the people are, but you know, if that that was a that was a inside joke related to our university, don't you think if this goes public, someone else like, what if what if our your classmate's mom listens to this? She she doesn't know what that means. So, mm. of, of course, audience is bigger than just what do people know and not. But but that's a lot of it, and kind of saying, oh my goodness, right? I have to start imagining someone who's bigger and different than me. That that changes things. Yeah. Yeah. And how have you found it when, because you both are talking about what's so exciting is you assign projects where students are creating their own type of podcast, that the difference between, say, a scripted podcast, which mine is not scripted, everyone knows that um, I've given Kyle and Tanya some talking points that we might discuss, but this is literally improvisational like we are going back and forth in an interview style Mm -hmm. um and i have though listened to here on our podcast my um contributor mary does a true crime in academia show and she has a script because she's looking at a case study and she's also by herself with the pod doing a solo show and i've only done a few solo uh discussions and i have to say um each presents a different challenge. I have to say, when you're by yourself, that energy is a challenge or trying to time what the conversation is. Again, though, it depends on if I was presenting a case study or presenting a news story, I definitely would want a script to reference instead of going off the cuff because uh, you might fall into murky waters if you're trying to recall a true crime story and then you're just pulling it from thin air. Um, actually, it could be def- defamatory and libel in certain yeah. cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, how do you discuss that with your students in terms of are you going to bring in guests? Are you going to do this as a solo project? Are you going to have a script or not? Yeah. So for me, well, I do different kinds of audio projects all of the time, but um I'll take the one that my students are doing right now. There's an NPR college podcast competition um, mm-hmm. that they put out every year and they're going to be accepting uh, submissions, I believe I want to say in September, but I'm, I'm using in this as an opportunity for my students to create something to submit to the contest. Oh, great. So when you look at the previous, you know, um, finalists and winners of that contest, it's all across different kinds of genres, right? And so some of them might be, like you're saying with your show, improv, maybe discussion-based, interview-based, but others are like very crafted that would kind of kind of fall in the genre of narrative journalism, or some are more of like um, audio memoir. So for my students, what they do is that they're, you know, they come up with the idea and they think carefully about the genre in which they're going to use, right, to convey this idea. And then they study that genre. So if they were doing something like, you know, what you're doing with your podcast, improv, you know, you have guests on, they'd listen to a bunch of podcasts in that particular genre and think carefully about what do they need to do in order to create something like that. And then the same goes with the students, you know, they're doing all all different kinds of genres. So same with the students who are doing memoirs, you know, listening to a bunch and thinking carefully about the genre and, you know, the conventions of that particular genre, what they kind of need to do in order for 
it to be in that genre and then ways they can subvert that genre, ways that they can do something interesting and exciting. So that's all a long way to say, but <laughs> they're studying the genre and whatever kind of, whatever scripting process or process in general lends itself to that genre um, is what that they'll they'll be doing. Yeah. And not because I don't want to hear from Kyle, but to follow up with that, oh, no. Tanya, I'm just curious, when you first approach all of these genres, is there a particular stare, um, a misguided belief? I was going to say stereotype, but a misguided belief that your students hold about the podcast uh, spectrum as a universe uh, that they um, it's most likely dispelled right away from your lesson. Like, what is that belief they have that is not true to the field of podcasts? Well, I think to Kyle's point earlier, like a lot of them don't listen to to podcasts a lot um some of my students will be um the students that i have had that have been really engaged in listening to podcasts a lot of them are like true crime junkies so they have an understanding of that particular genre other ones are like sports mm -hmm. podcasts mm -hmm. so it kind of seems like whatever that you know, exposure or engagement they have in any particular podcast, they think that that's the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. But then we kind of like provide them, like there's a buffet of different kinds of podcasts that exists, right? And we go through all of the different styles and do some listening to all of these different ways in which people, you know, utilize this big umbrella genre with all of these subgenres within it. Yeah. And I, I think part of it too is, I've listened to NPR for so much of my life. Like I think of though this the various kinds of shows that you'll hear on there, whether whether it's just like the everyday This American Life uh, kind of kind of special shows that they bring in. Um, but I guess I mean that more as more of a special thing, or of just the the everyday news type shows. But then I think about when did I start doing that, and it was probably right after college. When I was in college, I wasn't listening to NPR. Like I, and yeah. you know, and I I didn't have a smartphone either. Like there. there yeah. So sometimes I'll be like, what? You don't know about this. I'm like, oh, right. I have to go back. Um, but there, there are so many, so many things you can get from just little radio snippets, you know, just a, a three minute piece where if you, if you break it down, you're like, okay, they're, they're blending interview tape with some of the ambient tape that they got on the street um, with their kind of narrator in the studio voice versus their, I'm out on the street telling you things voice um, sometimes with music mixed in, sometimes not. And just, there, there's a lot of complex audio that if you start paying attention to, to it and start asking yourself, how how did they probably do that? Then you can kind of start training them to listen like a writer, li listen like a sound writer, listen like someone who's going to make this one day. They'll, they can start finding it. But again, we have to, we have to give them a lot of chances for that listening first. Yeah. yeah, well, and I was so keyed in on chapter four about the interview process because I wanted to see how you were both discussing it. Yeah. And I realized, oh, yeah even without your language or without discovering your book that I had found the same advice. But now that I have your book, Sound Writing, which I, everyone gets 20% off of all Broadview Press books with our <laughs> podcast code in the show notes, just putting that out there, uh, that, <laughs> you know, I have to do my job. Uh, yeah. As a way, I always looked to Terry Gross as a mentor with her arts and culture interviews, but I also looked to figures such as daytime talk show hosts. Mm -hmm. Like in a way, I feel that I blend talk show host with more of a traditional literary um, author interview style. Um, because I find Terry Gross is a little more formal in how she brings up topics. Like it is very... Um, she has certain points she's going to make where a talk show host brings their personality. Like we don't really learn about Terry Gross's life yeah. ever unless she gives her own interview to another show, which doesn't happen a lot. Um, but I like to imbue my own life with my guests because we're all interconnected somehow in the way we think about our process. And I think it's a little, you know, you have to find what's unique and um, speaks to your authenticity. Like I always say to any podcaster who wants to start out, 
just make sure it speaks to your heart that you're not just trying to put on an act mm -hmm. like become like I would never just start a comedy podcast because I'm not trained as a comedian, even though there might be humorous moments. I listen to comedy podcasts and I listen to all genres like pop culture, true crime, uh, news shows. Uh, and I need to do that deep research for my own style. So I'm so glad that you all, you discussed that with your interview chapter. Like make sure you're actually listening to podcasts who bring on guests so you can see that there's deep research involved before the guests sit down. Like I know about Tanya and Kyle's work. I didn't just <laughs> sporadically bring them on, you know, <laughs> but some people do. Some people I've heard, they think they can bring a guest on and not know about who they are. And I tell them, no, no, that's, you know, you don't need canned, you shouldn't have canned answers in my opinion, like questions that are canned and know mm -hmm. what they're going to say. Cause then there's no surprise, mm -hmm. but you have to at least know the overall of their work. That's the thing I yeah. love about Terry Gross is that you can always, you always get the sense like she's actually read this book. She has seen this movie. She's not just, no. and I don't know if that's true, but at least it come, comes across that way. I, what I was going to say too about, your, you know, you were reading the interview chapter to see what's there. I would say, maybe this is too meta, but I, as a textbook co-author, I struggle a lot with, I don't want it to sound obvious. I don't like the textbook tone of like, of preachiness of kind of like, here's this thing. Here, here's a list of things that anyone in their right mind could have just come up with. I'm just going to come up with it and tell it to you just to fill the page. Like I, I really didn't want to do that. And yet there's, there's necessarily though, a some people are going to find certain parts obvious. Some people are going to read the interview part and say like, Oh, I, I could have written this. I, I get this. This is all, this is all logical. So I think I, I started seeing the textbook process more as a, as a, Hey, here's some stuff that you might not have thought of. You might have, this might not be surprising, but maybe the next line will be, or maybe it's just kind of a way to check yourself. Maybe you made something and you have a draft and you want to revise it. And then the way to, to make sure you're revising it well is to kind of use some sort of outside source as, as a checklist. And you could kind of go through parts of the book and say, Oh, I didn't think about that, that using, using silence in that way. That's not something I would have thought of. Good point. So mm -hmm. I, th I think to me, a lot of it is just like, a, I hope it, sparks people's minds no matter where they are in the process if they're just starting or if they're drafting or if they're already think they're done and they kind of want to go back and double check things mm -hmm. yeah. and ideally i say to my students like you know put it next to you right well they don't have the the the, the hard copy yet but they had they had the previous pdf version like yeah. put it next to you as you're composing questions come to mind and you're thinking like i need some support right now on this we have lots of here we have lots of tips and advice and support that you can glean from the text it's as much of a read through engage with it but also go back to it again and again and again right uh for support while you're composing and you seek so much advice from those in the business, which is so important. Like, I love that you bring in voices of podcasters, of media figures. I am like, I'm now connected to a lot in digital media spaces just because of the longevity of my podcast and having sponsorships now, which is a whole other aspect that <laughs> I have interns who are in the Stony Brook English department, and I'm so lucky to have them and they're learning some of them sit in on my interviews, um, which is a wonderful process. They craft the episode notes, the social media strategies, what's going to be released as a video teaser. And there's a lot of branding that has started to come up about what's the cover art going to look like. But again, mm -hmm. um, that's the journey of my podcast is a small business. Like I have a certificate. That's a whole different conversation. And I always say to those who like have some of your students continued their podcast, like have some of them actually thought of ways to monetize it. For me, do you mind if I start? No, no please, please. Okay. So for me, um, the, the person that I I'm talking about before the person whose honors thesis that I'm advising, I mean, he has laid out an entire podcast. It's of a fantasy world that he created. And so for this project, you know, it took him a full year, but that's a full year of like 
learning how to do this work, which is hard and difficult, challenging, you know, extremely time consuming um, for him, but he has a whole podcast laid out. So, which is exciting with sketches of different, you know, what each episode or he's calling them transmissions uh, will look like. So he has, he's not at the point where he has heavily begun to market it, though it's on Spotify and he has kind of, you know, tried to spread the mes- message via social media and stuff, but he's going to be getting into the that kind of process, which as you're saying, it's a whole different kind of thing, right? A whole different world creating it as a kind of little small business, like you said. It becomes a publicity campaign, which that's why now I've connected to a lot of publicists and I know media figures and pop culture and there's a whole, um, there's a game. Well, maybe game is making it seem as if (laughs) it's very calculated. There's a press tour, there's, you going on other podcasts if you want to maintain a larger audience. But I'm so excited for that honors thesis. And definitely, do you want to shout out his podcast, Tanya, if it's on Spotify? It's called The Tales of Elu, E-L-I-U. Okay, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, wonderful. His name is Joseph Boba. Oh, great, great. And, you know, Kyle, have you had students who have wanted to expand their projects? Not necessarily in the way you're talking about. Um, the best example I have is I, I was working with a student a semester or two ago who who had taken a, a class with me specifically on on sound writing. And he's an undergrad student who for his his final English major, like senior seminar project, he decided to, to do a podcast about, um, about hip hop in secondary ed, essentially. And he was like, you know, I, I feel like, I don't know if anyone told him this or if he was just feeling, he's like, I feel like everyone is going to want me to write an essay. And I just, people have to hear it. They have to hear the hip hop I'm talking about. They have to hear why this matters. They have to hear, not just quote Tupac's um, exam, um, interview where he's he's defending some things that align with my arguments. They have to actually hear it in Tupac's words. So he was really excited to do it as a, I think a six episode podcast i don't know if he's actually released it publicly or not we talked about doing it and he wanted to um but it, it was cool to kind of see some some of the the germs of something from from my class turn into to kind of a next academic step at least but for him it's he's an education major he's going to be a teacher um he's hoping to go teach at the school where he kind of felt like he was a disaffected student who didn't like what was going on there and he just sat in the back and listened to hip-hop all the time and he's like well now i want to be that guy who's using that to, to make myself a better teacher. So it's kind of a, I see it as like an intermediate towards professionalism step for him. Yeah. Well, we've been very idealistic and I love staying in the utopic vision of media, but there is, of course, I think everyone listening out there would say there are ethical dilemmas. There are ethical dilemmas, especially with students on the topic they discuss. I mean, I've faced this. I bring in sex studies, I sex studies meaning like academic studies of sex. Um, and but I've also brought on figures who are going to be polarizing, right? Like Marianne Williamson is running as a Democrat. Like that's going to be speak to a certain person and it's not going to speak to others. But I've had social media comments that I know are going to go back and forth. Like one of her videos has over 800 comments on TikTok and people just went, they were ricocheting back and forth, starting a conversation. And I had to just like stop. (laughs) I told my whole team, just don't chime in. Let everyone do what they're doing. You have to be very grounded with certain topics that you're discussing. And also here we're not cursing, but I do have an explicit option for my podcast if there's cursing. And, you know, how do you discuss that with your students about the topic they're going to discuss, what language they use? Do they have questions about that in the college classroom? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm pausing because I don't have I don't think I have a very good answer. I mean, I could kind of work my way through it. What do you have, Tony? I mean, I have it's like it's it's all about 
genre. Uh, you know, it all comes back to audience <laughs> and genre. It all comes back to audience and genre. Um, and it also comes back to, yeah, I mean, w- where is this thing going to be in my classroom? You can do whatever you want. You can swear. You can, you know, you can focus on a topic that might shock your mother. Um, you know, it's all in my classroom they're free to do whatever they want, but of course they have to think about beyond the classroom and do they want their work to be shared on social media or maybe, you know, only with their peers or maybe only with me. Um, but they're also, yeah, they're needing to think about their audience in that way. And for me, this conversation extends to copyright too, which might not seem like a logical connection, but you know, we, we do a lot of projects or, smaller exercises or bigger things and and we always talk about okay is this just an exercise just for us we're just playing around mm-hmm. um if we're just playing around you can use beyonce as your background music you can you can say or curse or however you feel it same same thing it, we we talk about you know this being a safe place to express yourself whatever whatever way you want to um and you know we train ourselves to listen and comment on each other's stuff even if it surprises surprises us um but occasionally some some projects including my kind of bigger final like building up to a podcast on i do say these are going to be public if you use music it's either got to be public domain or creative commons license or you have to have a fair use argument and we talk about what that fair use argument would look like um how how are you going to be more likely to be fair with that copyrighted stuff um but that also extends that yeah how how crass or not crass you know etc et what what topics do you want to talk about how do what do you want people to find when they Google your name right now or in the future? All those things we all always talk about. They've they've heard it before. Um, so I think I think students are usually pretty savvy about what do you want people to know about you? And sometimes they they're even, you know, more kind of shy and private than I expect them to be, you know. Yeah, mm. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and with the Ivory Tower boiler room, you know, I'm using it as a case study just yeah. for your sound writing book, but what I love is you both touch so much in your book about just not only the importance of your intended audience, but it, is it reflecting the, is the media project, is it reflecting your work that you do? Like, do you want it to be a amplified version of what you do say for my case, it's what I do in the college classroom. So like anyone I bring on the my podcast, I would incorporate like what is political narrative, you know, with Marianne Williamson. What is Ebony K. Williams was on The Real Housewives of New York and she was the first black housewife and she's a lawyer. So I talked, I brought that in actually in a discussion about the novel Passing to my students before I even knew Ebony, but now I know her. So <laughs> Like everything that I've done is in a type of pedagogical way, even if it's sex in the media. Like, so I, you know, I have a vision and a plan that I've laid out, just like your student Tanya did, um, which is a business plan in my case. And like what speaks to the mission of the podcast. But some people want to be anonymous, right? You can have an anonymous podcast. Uh, There's a podcast called Dumois and it's all salacious gossip and you don't know what her name is. Like you can't crack her name but also that's a really good legal case because a lot of it could be considered slander and now you can't track who's actually doing the slandering sorry Dumois if you listen to but I mean but it's a it's a wonderful <laughs> listen of course I mean we like gossip mm-hmm. as a culture so again you can still she's making money off of it but she's not getting the credit right you don't know it's Hillary uh, I was going to say Hillary Swank. If I was, <laughs> I was gonna say, not Hillary Swank. But it's, you know, it's, you can't actually give the person credit, which mm-hmm. is unfortunate, but I don't think she wants the credit in her actual day-to-day work. So yeah, there's, I do want to touch upon those social media. Like how do you teach your students Um. How do you incorporate social media with these audio and film projects that you put bring into the classroom? Like, does social media intersect? Do you both think when you're, say, creating a podcast? So for me, not so much. 
Um, I mean, we talk about social media only as a way for them to share their work mm -hmm. with others. But aside from that, no. What about you, Kyle? Honestly, honestly, not much. No, I think. Yeah, I feel like I used to teach with a lot more social media. I there was a day. I mean, I don't know how many years ago where. I would I would require students that to, to have a Twitter account even if they just made a disposable one for class. Uh, more like you know in the pandemic I was using Discord like a lot of people were, uh, but you know it just it felt felt like the creepy treehouse syndrome a little bit like I was I was forcing students for a, a grade. Have, have you heard that phrase? It was, it was thrown around a while, a while back. Like it's it's kind of like the students have a space and they have their own treehouse that they like to go to and do their own thing. And then I come up and I'm like, hey, I get to be here too as the professor for class. And it so I, I think the focus for me is a lot more, hey, you might have a lot of things you want to do with this sound right now, but you might not. You might, might want to just like use this as a chance to practice your skills to get uh, some basic ideas that you might find yourself applying in a future class and a future job, future uh, leisure activity, whatever. But I don't, I don't think I really walk them through the kind of social media marketing, what you've been doing so much. It's not really my strength. <laughs> well, and, but it, it, op it also opens up a can of worms. <laughs> um, well, in terms of do they want their, is it a public or a private project? And I'm so, everything has become so public, whether it's, you know, my TikTok, my Instagram, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, like I have every kind of social media to promote, but at the same time, everything has to be crafted around, does this actually speak to the work I do? And um, it's definitely impactful depending on the career your students are going into. Uh, you know, like if an employer sees how public they've been on a certain topic and it doesn't match the um, workforce or doesn't match that uh, institution's mission, it can be um, used against them. Sounds so harsh, but it can really determine their job. And it could, sense. and it can work in the opposite way too, right? That's what's exactly. so complicated about it. It's like, oh my goodness, look at this person with a voice and with an opinion, and they're jumping out there, and we're so proud of that. Well, yeah, like for me, I never thought I would start to be connected to those in reality TV, but I have. Mm -hmm. But that's also because I've embraced. I always consider myself an academic entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Like that's this new term I started to use, which is like the podcast has taught me about how open I want to be with these topics. So yeah, I'm probably how open I am with my gay academic and LGBTQ plus work is not going to speak to say Liberty University, but you know, sometimes I'm, I'm manifesting and the places that are speaking to me are those who want to incorporate a podcast with their students. Like they want that voice. And yeah, I mean, I've had my students get to ask Gregory Maguire questions. And that's mm -hmm. wonderful. I like to always peel back the curtain, mm -hmm. literally. <laughs> that's like a Wizard of Oz metaphor there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, as we're, you know, wrapping up, this has been just such a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you both. And what was something that the two of you discovered together uniquely because of your working relationship on this book that you're now carrying forth in the classroom, like something Tanya you learned from Kyle and Kyle something you learned from uh, Tanya in your sound writing collaboration. I'm like more inclined to talk about what we learned together through the process. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking specifically about chapter two and how we wanted to explain how to listen as, as a means to help someone become a better sound writer and that chapter went through like what four different versions different like completely different yeah we rewrote it many times yeah we rewrote it and I think that process of us you know working together to write to give each other feedback you know to change it then change it again then change it again and that's like come together and we're like okay this idea is good like we we like this idea so 
I don't know, that was not what you asked, but it's just something that comes to mind when I think about this project and the amazing things that happened with it. Yeah, yeah I think, I, yeah. Look, I, I just think building off of that, that I think that I'm I'm reminded of just how collaborative this world can be, and I, of course that's almost a cliche. You could say that about any any world, but you know, we we've worked on this together since. I mean, you first approached me probably in 2019 about this, 18. I, yeah. Um, and and since then, you know, we've we've led workshops together at at Four C's, the major pro, um conference in our field. We've uh we just a couple of weeks ago we zoomed into someone's class specifically about this, uh. And I feel like everywhere we go, especially at conferences, but also beyond that, there, we're meeting people and we're connecting with people, and and even even being here is a is a connection. And there, there's something really good about about how when when two people or more could go deep working together, how that is never just going to stay there. It's going to expand and and impact others beyond that. And I think this is what the pandemic, in terms of media, taught us. Really, is that the networking process of not working in silo spaces that we really are learning from each other. And I don't know, in my feeling, that's what's exciting about the university is um, that it's now connecting to the public, to an audience that can hear about specialized topics like this, like sound writing, but understand, oh, I'm a part of sound writing, like, or, oh, I'm a podcaster. I'm a listener of podcasts. I listen to audiobooks. that it is um, accessible. Mm -hmm. And I always say all specialized academic fields are accessible. It's just the delivery of the content, like how you're communicating the knowledge. And yeah, good. I'm can't thank you both enough because sound writing as a book in its reading process is you talk back to the audience too and bring them in. It's such a wonderful reading experience, um, free of technical jargon. Like the technical jargon is explained. It's just, it's not thrown out there. But I don't think, I think writing nowadays is so accessible in academic spaces because the public is consuming it. Like we are inviting them in as readers. Um, yeah. So, that was wonderful. I lo yeah. loved having you both on. This was, I Thank can't you. wait to continue our conversations in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Kyle. Everyone out there, you can get sound writing um, on Broadview Press. And I just want to make sure, um, well, I was going to say, you know, that hopefully I'll be back in Salem. I'm telling you, Tanya, I don't know what happened, but Salem put it, literally put a spell on me uh, <laughs> when I was there right before the pandemic. It was in March, March, that first week. And I toured the House of the Seven Gables because I am a 19th century critic. And I would love to live in Salem. Like if I had anything to do in Boston, I would choose Salem. Like I'm a big fan of the, periphery uh villages or towns i like anything right outside the city center um i like a train ride and oh good um uh kyle just sent me something about the history of sound writing so i'm gonna have to include that for the listeners out there uh those of you who love etymology and the meaning of words but yeah so go to broadview press um, it's in our episode notes to get your hands on sound writing and uh, use the code ivory tower for 20% off. And yeah, I can't wait to talk to you both more. And thank you again for coming to the ivory tower boiler room. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone out there.